Thank you very much, Hugo, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, on the way up to the stage about 30 seconds ago, Hugo said to me, why, do you, why are you here? Why, are you, why do you care about this stuff? And um, it was a good question. And I guess the, the real reason is because I grew up outside Peter Maritzburg in a, in a place called Townbush Valley. So I spent a lot of my youth walking in the hills with the dogs, and I was at that interface between the wild and the, and the city. And I guess this is, in some ways, a, a, a farm boy's perspective on the city. Um, but what I want to talk about is cities in a different perspective, from a different perspective. Because when we talk about a city, we talk, sometimes we mean the infrastructure, the roads, the buildings, etc., the place. Sometimes we mean the, the city council, the governance structure. Sometimes we mean the, the infrastructure and the people, Cape Town and the Cape Tonians. But we sometimes miss the fact that uh, a city is a community, and a community is created by the relationships. In other words, it's not the buildings or the people in particular, it's the relationships between all of those. So I want to talk about cities as, as organisms, as uh, places in which, through which energy flows, places of becoming, if you like, because a city really is a network of relationships, and it's constantly changing and evolving, and the question is, how is it going to change and evolve? So I'm talking about cities from a relatedness perspective. And of course, the other really important thing about cities is that cities are the basis of civilization. In fact, so they share the same root. So when we're talking about the future of our civilization, we are talking very much about cities as well, particularly now that, that uh, more than 50% of our species um, lives in, in cities. So. Um, if I then talk to the, the question of why I've chosen to say symbiotic cities, um, really, this is a, a word from biology, as you know, and I'm wanting to, to emphasize the fact that this is about the relationship. So symbiosis is about the living together of dissimilar organ organisms. Now, this question of dissimilarity is fundamental to how we perceive our civilization as well. So civilization has grown up in contradiction to nature. There's, the, the, there's the, the, the city and the city's way of thinking and the people, and then there's nature, the wild, and that's what's been excluded from the city. What I'm suggesting is that we need to think in terms of the relationships. How are we going to relate? Because symbiosis is, is, is long-term living together, but there are different qualities of symbiosis. So you can have mutualism, which is mutually beneficial for, for both parties, and you can have uh, uh, parasitism, where the parasite is, is uh, benefiting at the expense of the host. So what I'm, I'm wanting to draw attention to, let's see what happens when we look at cities from a completely different perspective. And, of course, the context in which our discussion is happening is one in which um, industrial civilization is in its uh, terminal phases. Um, in my view, industrial civilizations which dominate the world today are toast. They may take quite a long time before they, they um, end, and they may not collapse, they may uh, transform. But industrial civilizations in the form that we know it, I believe, are finished. And we, climate change enjoys a lot of coverage, and of course with the COP17 coming to Durban uh, later this year, it's going to be a big uh, issue in, in, in our country. But climate change is often touted as, as the biggest problem in the world. But climate change isn't the problem. Climate change is a symptom of a dysfunctional relationship between our species and the rest of the planet. And there are many other, there are many other similar um, symptoms. We've got depletion of, of fresh water, we've got collapse of fish stocks, we've got loss of fertile soils, and so on and so on and so on. So, but the, the real issue is that we are in the end days of, of industrial civilization, and if you extrapolate forward on the, per, the path that we, we're going, and if you read the scientific evidence, there's, there's I don't think it's, it's really, um, it's hardly debatable that if you extrapolate those paths forward, they end in, in um, disaster. That doesn't mean we will get there, of course, because it's possible to change your paths, and that is, I hope, what we're going to do. So the context of civilization Industrial civilization, I think, is heading towards disaster, and the building blocks of that industrial civilization are cities. And it's not like 
collapse can't happen. There are plenty of examples, Easter Island being one, in which mighty civilizations that uh, exploited their environment, overexploited their environment, that were, were too concerned with their own ideological models and that it was more important to be building up the esteem of their chief by building monuments like this rather than looking after the ecology on which they depended, collapsed. So collapse is real. It's the story of most civilizations. And so we need to take this very, very seriously. So if we look at the model of civilization that we have really driven by industrial civilization, um, the, the, the discovery that, that we could get extra energy from coal and oil. We didn't just have to get energy from what we ate. And that, that drove the development of the industrial uh, cities. And of course, those industrial cities, they weren't really designed to be great habitats for hu human beings. They were designed to serve the industrial model of production. So obviously, in the industrial um, era, you had terrible working conditions. And although, obviously, we, the ideas of cities have uh, evolved since then, there is still very much that um, uh, industrial thinking underlying it. And cities have continued to, to sprawl across the world. And for every city, there is a vast hinterland. The cities are drawing resources from enormous areas around them, water, food, etc. And most cities now are effectively the hinterland on which they draw is the entire world. So when we look at a city nowadays, we, we, we tend to see it in terms of, of transport systems and people and, and infrastructure, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and very much, when you look at a picture like that as, as a city, what you see is the people in the buildings, um, less likely to notice the trees. And what I believe is underlying that is a, is a particular worldview. The worldview is, I think, symbolized in this picture. It is of us as separate from the world, superior to the world. The world is a plaything for us. It is resources to be divided up into countries, to be exploited and used for human beings. So in other words, the, the reason for existence of the world is the human, a deeply anthropocentric worldview. Everything revolves around us, and that is also the, the, the thinking that drives most people's understanding of cities, how cities are governed, how cities are structured, etc. But fortunately, there's another worldview emerging or re-emerging. This is both a very ancient worldview, the idea of, of the, the Earth as a, as a living organism of which we are part, but it's also the worldview of, of cutting-edge uh, theories like the, the Gaia theory, which has demonstrated scientifically that, this, that the Earth is a self-regulating organism. It maintains the composition of the atmosphere, the temperature, etc., um, through the complex interactions between living aspects of the planet. Um, it's, also, it's also the world of, of subatomic uh, physics, the idea that everything in the world is um, linked in some mysterious way, that you can get non-local um, connections, etc. And this, of course, is a very different worldview to the one in, reflected in, in the previous slide. And one of the ways in which that this is emerging more recently is, is um, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Now, after the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference in... Um, sorry, the, the climate change conference in Copenhagen collapsed, the, and you recall that the protesters were kept far away from it, um, there were backroom deals at the last minute, um, people, huge numbers of people were arrested in the, in the streets. The Bolivian president said, this is ridiculous, climate change, the people's voice on, on climate change needs to be heard. I'm going to call a People's World Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. And he did that um, in in April 2010 in Cochabamba in Bolivia. Anybody who in the world who wanted to come could come. Then what happened, they were expecting about 15,000 people. What happened was the, um, the Icelandic volcanoes went off and you couldn't fly out of Europe and you couldn't fly through Europe. So nobody from Europe could get there and large parts of Asia, North Africa people couldn't get there. So they thought, oh, this is going to be a bit of a disaster. And 35,000 people turn up. People came down from the hills People came all, from all over Latin America, from Africa, all over the world. So there was a, suddenly this huge turnout. And, you know, Copenhagen had been a, a bad-tempered arm wrestling match with each country or, or bloc trying to get uh, advantage for themselves. Cochabamba was completely different. Cochabamba, everybody was communicating about how to put into words a, a radically different worldview of what needed to be done um, if our species was going to survive and prosper and to communicate to the, that to the world. And one of the ways of doing that was we, we drafted and ad adopted a universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth, which is intended to be a companion piece 
or to contextualize, if you like, the Universal Declaration of, the, of Human Rights. Because human rights, we say we have human rights like um, the right to life, not because our government gave it to us, not because the courts gave it to us, but because we exist as human beings. In other words, by virtue of our very existence. And those human rights, the right to life, are actually meaningless if you don't have, for example, water. And you, we won't have water if we don't protect the rights of rivers to flow, of mountains to exist, of forests to, f forests to flourish. So shifting this, this idea, um, is, is using the law in this different way, is really a way of trying to um, change governance systems so they more accurately reflect the reality of what you see there. So the t that is the, the emerging worldview of Mother Earth as a unique, indivisible, self-regulating community of interrelated beings that sustains, contains, and reproduces all beings. So what I'm suggesting is what would a city look like if you're coming from that worldview? And so let's, let's, let's try it out. Let, let's shift. So instead of standing at arm's length holding the, the Earth as resources, let's imagine that we're in the Earth looking up that we are part of this community. And I think that, I don't think, I believe very deeply that we are earthlings. Everything, our bodies are composed entirely of the, of the earth. We are, we've evolved within this community. We don't make no sense anywhere else. Put us on the moon or Mars and we would be dead in seconds. Um, so we are more accurately understood as aspects of earth rather than anything entirely different. So what, what would cities look like from this perspective? And I think it's very liberating to do this because suddenly, the, pow, you know, the, those narrow constraints of anthropocentrism uh, evaporate and you start seeing all kinds of exciting possibilities. So let's think about a city, which is a self-regulating uh, community, as if it were something like a forest, which is also a self-regulating community. Forests also cr create microclimates as, as cities do. And just very quickly, if we look at the city community, it's, a, it's mainly a monospecies habitat, mainly humans. The forest, on the other hand, is an integrated multi-species community. So wouldn't it be interesting if city planners started planning for all kinds of species? What happens if we planned a city to be a good habitat for birds and frogs as well? What happens if we planned it so that the it was permeable to the wild. Instead of having um, the, 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 the Cartesian division between cities and civilization versus nature, we said, let's have wild rivers flowing through the cities. Let's free the rivers from their concrete cages and their can canals and, and start bringing in the other species. A city would look very different. City communities are net consumers of food, draw food f from vast areas, normally of monoculture. But the forests, on the other hand, are producing food primarily through photosynthesis. And there's amazing stuff people are doing in the world. Um, the, I've seen some research where, where people are, are, are trying the idea of taking the excess CO2 produced by cities and, and bubbling it through water to promote algae growth, which you can then use for all kinds of purposes. So you're starting, to, the city from this perspective starts becoming more and more like a forest. But just the liberation of thinking that you don't have to just be a net consumer. Um, water, cities increase the pollution, forests decrease the pollution. Um, cities, the hard surfaces er everywhere, basically makes the water run off very fast and hard into the canals and, and, and down into the sea and, and, and the, through the stormwater drains and the sewers. The forests, on the other hand, um, the, the forests, sorry, the, 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 I see the arrows the, the wrong, wrong way, the, the cities increase the runoff, the, 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 um, the forests, on the other hand, absorb the water, let it trickle down, it purifies it, it sinks to the roots, and it, it works very differently. What would a city work like if we started capturing the water, if we started purifying it, if we started using it perhaps for, for aquaculture um, as it moves through the city? There are all kinds of possibilities that open up as soon as you think it of a city from a different perspective. Uh, pollution, do we have to carry on polluting? Why can't we be more like a forest which increases oxygen? We, uh, cities give out huge amounts of CO2. Forests sequester it. Um, how could we do that? That would be an interesting thing. Waste, instead of just accumulating bigger and bigger waste dumps everywhere, why can't we be more like the forest where there's no waste 
aim for zero waste, where everything is recycled and fed back. So, just to, to, to pull it together, essentially our cities currently tend to consume their hinterland and inevitably this linear process will lead to collapse. Forest communities are effectively immortal, not that they'll necessarily live together, but because they are integrated participants in this larger community and they have healthy relationships, they can carry on forever. And I'd just like to end off with the words of, of somebody who's been a great mentor to me, Thomas uh, Berry, who, who said that the distorted dream of an industrial technological paradise is being replaced by a more viable dream of a mutually enhancing human presence within an ever-renewing, organic-based earth community. The dream becomes the myth that both guides and drives the action. So what I'm saying is if we need to, what we need is a new form of civilization. In order to have a new form of civilization, we have to rethink the building blocks of civilization, the city. We have to redream the city. And um, unless we, and we, if we redream the city and put in a new, uh, a new myth about what the city could be, uh, um, that can drive the action and inspire people to create the cities. So we are incredibly fortunate uh, members of this earth community. This is the most incredible, beautiful, complex, dynamic, spectacularly beautiful community in the entire universe as far as we know. We haven't found anything even remotely um, approaching it. But if, you want, if we want to stay part of that community, and to be honest, our continued participation in that community is currently in question, then we need to play by the rules of that community. And what that means is we have to rethink the city so that it, it functions and becomes more like an organism which is fully integrated into the web of life and which contributes to the whole. So I hope that all of you will join with me in shifting away from that anthropocentric position of holding the world out there as, as, as something to be exploited. Embed yourself in the earth, become an earthling, and start changing yourself and your communities from that perspective. Thank you.